so glad you're here with us this morning as we take a Sunday to focus on what truly is a reality around the world. Um, today, more than ever, uh, people who are followers of Jesus Christ are being persecuted for their faith uh, simply because they refuse to deny Jesus as Lord and Savior in the culture and the community that they're from. Uh, several weeks ago, uh, one of our members, her name is Jennifer Cox, uh, she, uh, she's one of our, been here with us for several years now, and um, God, through her, through her walk with the Lord, kind of came with this burden on her heart to share what God laid on her heart towards the persecuted church, and we felt led to devote this service today uh, to sharing her testimony of what God's doing in her life. Uh, Jennifer's husband is David Cox, he's got three children, Emily. Abby and Mary Catherine, um, stay-at-home mom, uh, just a normal lady, just like you guys, uh, just listening to what God's telling her to do. So I want to invite her to come up here now and share her testimony and share what God's doing in her life. So will you give her a big welcome as she comes, please? <clears throat> Jennifer is a part of... Uh, the Robert, Barry Roberts community groups. I know a lot of them are out here been praying, anxious to, to hear. They have been hearing for several weeks what now we get to share with you. So Jennifer, thank you for coming. Um, and just kind of start out, I know we saw that video, but I know there's a lot more statistics that you can educate us on today. So why don't you share with the group um, some more things that's going on around the world with the persecuted church. Okay, um, as you see on the screen, there are, first of all, let me like, define what Christian persecution is um, a lot of times we think it's just you know being martyred but it's so much more than that um, they're beaten beaten tortured they can be imprisoned um, forced out of their homes their land um, forced into slavery um, any the hostility towards them because of their faith so um, there's more persecution going on now than there ever has been. And there's one, as you see on the screen, there's 100 million people in the world now are being harassed, oppressed, or killed for their faith. Over 75% of the world lives in some form of religious persecution. <clears throat> and an average of 180 Christians a month are killed for their faith. So. Um, you each should have a copy of a map. It and, should um, be on your chairs there somewhere. When I, when I started researching this out, when God laid this burden on me, um, I had no idea the extreme of it. So when I saw this map, I was blown away about the... Um, not only is it they're being persecuted, but as you see, it's color-coded, so they're being severely or moderately persecuted in these countries. And so I just wanted to talk about a few countries um, for you. I mean, as you'll see, no, North Korea is number one. Um, there's really no tolerance of Christianity in North Korea. Um, it, in the video, you saw that either you renounce your faith or um, you will be killed or, or they will send you to you know, the concentration camps. Right. And um, I learned that uh, there's over 50 to 70,000 Christians in, in concentration camps there in North Korea who are daily suffering. Um, there is a small amount of Christians there that, you know, are underground. They um, meet in secret, but that number is growing. Growing. Wow. Yes. Okay. It, as it, they're being persecuted, the church is thriving in North Korea, which... I was very encouraged by. Um, Iraq is number three, and they've been in the news lately. Mm -hmm. um, I learned an astonishing that 2003, there was over um, a million Christians in Iraq, and then today there's less than 0.1% of that. Okay. Um, as you might recall, you may have heard on the news last summer um, when ISIS started going in, they started pushing them out, and they gave them three ultimatums. They were either to convert to Islam, pay a heavy tax that, you know, it's an ungodly amount they can't even fathom paying, or they had to flee. And most of them, you know, chose to just leave their homelands and flee. So, and they've been pushed north into to Syria. Um, and so,
um, Nigeria is on here. <clears throat> and a lot of you may have heard that story in um, April of last year. Um, there's a, Isla, there's not Islam, yes it is Islamic, um, terrorist group, Boko Hakam, I don't know how to say it, but um, mm -hmm. they went in and kidnapped 276 girls in, from a school that were ages 16 to 18, and those girls are, I mean, they can't find them, they're gone, they're, um, were forced to convert to Islam, right. marry the regime, um, and they do this, they go in and kidnap Christian they go to Christian villages and they'll kidnap the women and um, force them into their regime. And um, and if they're not doing that, they, they also have Muslim herdsmen. Mm -hmm. I learned that um, are, are oppressing them and, and persecuting them and killing them by the thousands and hundreds. And so um, they need our prayers. Yeah. Um, and the last one I wanted to highlight was Mexico because um, it, it very shocking. It, yes, it was. It surprised me that it was on the list. This is the first year that it's been on the list, and so I researched out to see what kind of persecution they are having, and um, they are being persecuted by drug organizations. Um, they see the church as a revenue center, mm -hmm. and they also see them as. <laughs> something that's hurting their organization because they provide the drug rehab programs and for alcoholics and drug habit um, addicts so um, it's a Christian nation but they're they're starting to experience persecution okay. over there so in case you didn't hear that that the church is trying to combat the drug uh, cartel and everything going on there and they're actually being attacked for doing so okay um, I want uh, this is from Open Doors, this map, and um, they, this year, this they said that this is the most persecution, like I said earlier, that this, it's almost doubled since last year alone in, in the world, so. So, uh, just want to reiterate things. Open Doors, there's like many ministries out there that, that let us know what's going on with the persecuted church. Um, we read the Bible and we see persecution there. We are truly in the heaviest days of persecution around the world, um, even double to what it was last year. So, um, Jennifer, how this time last year, this is not even on the forefront of your mind. So how did, how did God captivate your heart as far as for the persecuted church? What happened? Tell us your story about how God gripped your heart in this area? Um, ashamedly, I, I do admit that, that it wasn't um, on my, the forefront of my mind. Um, you know, it's in the news now more than ever, so I feel like more people are hearing about it, but it's always been. And um, shame on us as a, a church here in the West who haven't put this on the forefront, but... Um, Amen. I... Um, I started out last service by telling this that um, three years ago, David and I got called to the youth ministry, and we worked there, and we, you know, loved it. And um, last year, we both felt like God was calling us out of that. And um, you know, it was kind of like, well, no, you know, no, we're just getting into loving these kids and enjoying it. So what are we? What am I supposed to do? Because I, I, I want to serve. I want to be serving somewhere. And so I started like, what am I supposed to do now, God? And um, so I went to several different, you know, Restoration Road was starting up then. And I went to that, those meetings and prayed through that. And um, I, that wasn't a yes. And I went to, I've, I've been to Heritage Village with that ministry and um, prayed through that. And that wasn't a yes. You know, it wasn't anything that God was just saying, this is, this is it. So I, I was looking for established ministries. Right. And so... Um, experiencing God when y'all offered experiencing God that first Sunday when they when y'all offered that and, and said we were going to do that David and I both felt like that's what we needed to do mm -hmm. and um, had no idea how God was going to work through that study um, I said this to the last service and I would say to y'all too that if when they offer it again if God puts anything on your heart to do that then I strongly encourage you to do it because he will do my amazing things through that study so um 
we got into um, experiencing God, and there's seven realities in experiencing God, and it was week seven, I believe, that um, it was on crisis of belief, and um, that is basically, you know, God's, if God gives you an assignment, and it's only something only he can do, you, you face a crisis of belief, like, are you going to believe him for what he says he wants to do for you, through you, in you, mm -hmm. um, or not, and... Um, that leads to faith in action. And so in studying that week, the last day was, was entitled Faith in Action. And I wrote out in the margin that um, just this week, 21 Egyptians were beheaded on a beach in Libya. I'm sure most of y'all heard that story on the That's news because right. it was pretty widespread. And um, so God had started working on my heart in that, and I was just burdened for them. That was like the first time I had heard of a persecution that touched me like that. And so I began like praying for them, um, for the persecuted brothers and sisters and um, that part of the world. And it became, a, I mean, it was a strong burden. It, it, it became a strong burden. Um, my experience in God group will tell you my husband will tell you that I was burdened and I would wake up in the middle of the night praying before I was even fully awake knew what I was praying you know for them it was that strong right. and that next week was on obedience be, being a cost there's always an a cost to a cost to obedience and uh, there was two quotes that stood out to me that week and I just meditated on them, and, and one of them is, Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me, and sever any tie except the tie that binds myself to thee. And I just, you know, I just prayed, prayed that over and over. And by Thursday of that, that week, I was broken. Um, He just led me to pray for them like I had never prayed for them before. And I, it took me a good 30 minutes to get myself together from that because I realized that I don't sacrifice anything. You know, they're over there sacrificing everything for their faith. And what do I do for right. mine? And so I, I just poured my heart out to God in that. And... Um, he gave me, he spoke to me after that and said, Andrea Deloach and open doors. And that was the only two things I heard. And I knew Andrea and I knew she had a heart for missions. I didn't have a clue she had a heart for the persecuted church. Okay. And open doors, as you stated, is an organization that ministers to the persecuted church. And I had no idea what that, had never even heard of you it before. You just heard, God just said, when you were praying what to do, God just said, Andrew DeLoach, open doors. Yes. That's it. Okay. And so I took, we had, we, that was on Thursday, and I went to my Spirits and God group that night, and I shared that with them. And, you know, animated Tom Davis said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I'm going to talk to Andrea DeLoach, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I did. I, I messaged her and asked her if, if she was going to be here that next Sunday. And, we got together, and I said, you're going to think I'm crazy probably. I said, but the Lord told me to come talk to you, and I don't know what this means, but I'm just telling you what he said. And so Andrew was like, okay, you know. And um, so she and I started meeting together and praying together, and she gave me resources. And she does have a heart for the persecuted church. She what, you know, was involved with the Voice of the Martyrs and was, you know, spoke for the Voice of the Martyrs. I had no idea that she had done any of that. And so um, in let me recap that. Voice of the Martyrs is another ministry with Persecuted Church that Andrea has been working for a couple of years for. Um, so that was the first confirmation there. What was the second one about that? When you say open doors, I thought it was funny in the first service what you thought that meant. Tell us oh, about yeah. that. I, when it was Andrea, and I was like, well, what does that mean? Open doors, does that mean Andrea is supposed to open doors, you know, for right. what this means? God, I don't, right. know what you're, I don't know what you're saying, you know, <laughs> at all. And so when I found out open doors was a, really a you know I was like whoa you know whoa so I didn't know what to do with that I mean I was I was very honest about that my experience in God group will tell you um so it was very clear that God wanted a ministry out of this mm -hmm. very clear and so 
I, I told y'all in the first service that I'm not a leader, I'm a follower, and, and I think I, I told them, Arnesta, you know, if Arnesta wants to boss me around and tell me what to do, I'm, I'm game with that, you know, right. I, just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. So when it was clear that, the, you know, God wanted a ministry out of this, and I found out Andrea, hey, Andrea's being part of Voice of the Martyrs, and I didn't voice this, but I think in my mind I thought, okay, Andrea's going to start this ministry, and I'm just going to piggy tail on the back of it and right. help her, you know. And um, in our first meetings, it was very clear that that was not the case, that Andrea, you know, was not the one to start the ministry and, you know, kind of bring this forth to the church that that burden had been placed on me. Mm. Uh, I hope you guys hear this, that she's, all Jennifer's doing is listening to what the Lord is telling her in her heart to do. Uh, and I hope you heard at the very beginning that she was busy doing God works. But God had paused her to listen for the work that God wanted her to do. I think one of the biggest distractions for us doing the God thing in our life is all the good things that we could do for God that we run out ahead and do, but we don't slow down enough to hear, God, what is it that you want me to do? And so I think it was great that you said no to a lot of things. I think it was great that you didn't just depend on the church to say, tell me what to do. But when you looked at it and even looked at all the other ministries, there was that big other. You know, there's something more. And so I hope, church, you're learning from that, that, that this, the experiencing God study was just a tool. It was a journey. But it was about you experiencing God. And God has a personal invitation for each of you that if we will just listen he will show you how to join him, um, especially like with Jennifer and what she's doing. And, and we also knew this, kind of walking through that journey and that study, when God puts something on your heart, he doesn't just put it on your heart. It doesn't just end with you. He puts it on others. Um, the heartbeat for a persecuted church has been going on for several years. Uh, God saw it fit to let you know. And so we believe in faith that there's others that God wants to be a part of this. So what is your invitation to us? What are you asking us to consider and pray about today uh, from what God has shared with you. Um, I want to just go off of what you said about um, God wanting to work in, in everyone. Um, I am a mess. <laughs> My family will tell you I'm a mess. Um, I was very overwhelmed in the beginning about, you know, God would even want to use me, and I still, we, we, we're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, so when I say God wants to use people and want and will use people, I truly mean that he can use anyone. Um, but as far as the ministry, I have no idea what it looks like, and that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm only taking it what he gives me at a time, and this is what we're doing today is the next step of what he said is I want you to take this before your church um, because I firmly believe that he already knows who who he has this on the heart for and people may have already had a burden mm -hmm. and didn't know that me or Andrew you know didn't know who has you know that anybody else had that burden so I firmly believe that the people that are here today hearing this or you know who they may tell from this that he already knows so um, I just wanted to get awareness out about that and that, that aspect of the hey God's working in this area Amen. and um so, but praying for them is the is a very big thing. First step. Yes, yeah. um, they will tell you that they want you to cover them in prayer. They feel the prayers. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, praying for them would be the next step in the ministry. And and uh, out in the foyer, I'll let you allude to what's out there. But one of the things in the foyer is a sign up sheet that if. If God has struck your heart or God's already been stirring your heart and this was just confirmation today, that the next step is, okay, let's get back before the feet of Jesus and listen. Oh, what does he want us to do? Jennifer's inviting you to come do that with her. Uh, as two or three gather in his name, there he'll be as well. And so if that's something tugging on your heart today, I ask you to fill that sign-up sheet up with your information so that Jennifer can let you know we will be planning a special prayer service uh, starting out once a month, you know, and we'll just kind of take it from there. God, what is it that you'd have us do beyond that? But we're going to be faithful with this first because we know he's told us that. So, so thank you. Jennifer, tell us a little bit more. What, what else do you have in the foyer and available today to equip us? Um, 
there's the sign up sheet. Uh, there is a information sheet. It's got different men, uh, organizations that minister to the persecuted church. Um, Open Doors being one. Uh, Vision Beyond Borders. They go in and distribute Bibles and. Um, so there's that information and just ways that you can, you know, educate yourself about it. Because, um, like I said, I know knew nothing about this. And when you start reading the, what's going on and start listening and um, hearing what's going on, it it changes everything. Amen. Amen. Give her give her a round of applause, guys. Um, thank you. We, we felt led at how to close this out. Um, testimony time was a special time of prayer uh, for the persecuted church. Um, and we're going to do that in two ways. First of all, we're going to invite about 16 people to come down front. We don't have you picked out. Uh, there are prayer cards down here at the altar <clears throat> that we're going to ask that 16 folks come to the altar, read over these cards, and just intercede at this moment uh, for uh, these these regions of the world that are going through persecution. And so in a moment, uh, we're going to ask you to start making your way. Uh, it doesn't have to just be exactly 16. Others can come. But when you come, there'll be a card in front of you. And we're just going to give you a moment to pray uh, for them as the rest of the congregation prays uh, and quiet as we pray over. And then Jennifer will, will close us in that prayer after a moment. Um, and then our band is going to lead us in a song of prayer. Uh, not saying that the church around the world that is suffering knows this song, but as we, we prayed about this service, this song came to our heart that what a, what a battle cry song, that our, our God is with us, our God is for us um, through all this. And we just believe that those that are standing up for their faith in Jesus, they're able to do that because they know God's presence is right there with them uh, and they're secure and safe in Him. So we're just going to have a time of prayer in those two ways. And so I want to invite you now, if you feel led to come to the altar, Pick up one of these prayer cards and just kneel at the altar and pray. We want to invite you to do that now. Just go ahead and be making your way. Um, and Ben, you go ahead and make your way to the stage as well. But I, I just want us to have a time of prayer. And then, Jennifer, when you feel led, just close us out. Okay. Father, I praise you. I praise you that you are truly Lord of all. And Father, I ask for forgiveness. Forgive me when I've taken for granted the awesome opportunity to come into your worship service. Forgive me when I take lightly that I have a copy of your word that I can open up any time, any day. And there are others that would give anything to have one page. Forgive me for the times that I've taken for granted that I can meet with my brothers and sisters openly without any fear in a community group forgive me for ignoring the cries of your people just because I live in this nation where we have it made God we really do So we come together today as a people united to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. Let every one of them right at this moment feel the prayers that we offer up to you. I pray for strength for them to stand firm. I pray for peace when they're suffering. Wrap your arms around them, God. Give them comfort. It's only you can. 
forgive us, God, when we just nonchalantly say we believe in you. Because, God, when they say they believe in you, their life is on the line. So may we be encouraged and strengthened because of them. God, I pray for their persecutors. I pray you reveal yourself to them in a mighty way. They might not trust in you or believe in you, but they wouldn't be able to deny your presence and know who you are. God, you've given us this insight. You've opened our spiritual eyes and our ears to hear. So I just pray that we would be a church that wouldn't take anything for granted and that we would be on our knees daily seeking you and your will for our lives and praying for our brothers and sisters, God. You are good and you are sovereign. You are worthy. I ask you to just keep standing as we read out of Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. It says, About that time, King Herod cruelly attacked some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, John's brother, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too. And during the days of unleavened bread, and after the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers, each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was being made earnestly to God for him by the church. Let's pray. Father, as we take a moment now to wrap up this service, God, looking Lord, at the testimony of Scripture, God, I, we thank you for the testimony that's come from the church today for our sister in Christ that has shared her burden and her heart, God, for what your heart bleeds for, Lord. And I pray that, um, God, I pray that we will have a teachable heart, God, to realize that, that this is a priority to you. So, God, lead us now as we, we study your, the testimony of Scripture and what you say and what you have recorded, Lord, about your church during the time of suffering. God, we pass this Jesus in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. We will look at that. We will um, look at this passage. And again, Jennifer, I thank you for sharing. It is very exciting to be a part of a church where God's not speaking through one person, but God is speaking through many, and many are following, and we have an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing in and through each other's lives, uh, in each other's lives. That is, that is what is incredible, that, that God wants to speak through you. God wants to use you, and I've been so blessed just to hear the testimony today also been challenged, and so I want to share this passage with you. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, About that time, King Herod. Who's King Herod? Uh, no, it's not a new uh, Caesar. Caesar is still on thro his throne. The Roman Empire is still in control. King Herod is the king of Jews. The Jews have not separated from the Roman Empire. It was in the culture and custom of these days that when Rome controlled an area or territory, they would still try to keep some cultural relevance, and so they would put other people in positions of power underneath their own power, kind of like puppets, and these individuals would rule and have some authority over the people in that land. And King Herod was nothing much more than a puppet to Roman Empire, uh, but kind of their connection to the Jewish people. And King Herod um, could not stand the Christian church. Uh, Jesus had made the comment, in fact, there will be a day that people will persecute you in my name thinking they're actually doing it as a gift towards God 
And so King Herod was not having a heart for God at all. He had a heart to be approved by the people. And when he saw the people at uproar, he was a good politician. He would try to cease that. And he saw that these Jews were causing a lot of frustration and animosity around the area. It seemed to be a threat to the Roman Empire, and they didn't want to be associated. So they tried themselves to bring persecution upon the church and to wipe it out. And so that's what you see King Herod's acts are doing in verse 1. About that time, King Herod cruelly attacked some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, John's brother, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter during the days of unleavened bread. And then after the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was being made earnestly to God for him by the church. King Herod takes James. If you study New Testament or you see that Jesus' 12 disciples, uh, there was three particular that got a chance to get a, a closer look of who Christ was, and that was James and John and Peter. Uh, some would say this was the inner circle, the, the three of the inner circle of Jesus Christ. They were the ones that witnessed Christ in the transfiguration. Um, these were those that would be seen as the leaders of everyone else, especially the modern day church at that time. James has been taken and now James has been killed. And because the people in that culture celebrated it, King Herod said, I'm on a roll, I need to do more of this. And so he grabs Peter. And he takes Peter and he puts him in prison. Now not only have you had one of the major leaders of the church killed, now you have another major leader, probably the face of the church by the lost world of that time. We know the face of the church is Jesus, but for them they said, hey, there's this Peter guy. If we can get rid of him, we can probably snuff out the church. And so Peter is arrested. Persecution was popular. We wear crosses today. If you'd have wore a cross back in the first century, it would have been offensive to the church because people would associate that with their Lord and Savior dying, but they'd also associate that with some of their own relatives and family members killed. Arenas. Could you imagine today stadiums filled with chanting and screams of Christians dying in arenas all because they were Christians? Persecution was the popular thing. So what, what's the point that I first want to share with you today? This is it. Persecution for the follower of Christ. Persecution for the follower of Christ should be expected. It should not be the exception. It should be an expectation, not an exception, to those who say, I am a follower of Jesus. This is why Christianity is not easy. This is why we can't uh, listen to and, and lap up a prosperity gospel that says if you follow Jesus, everything will be good and hunky-dory and you'll have an easy road just as you'll just follow Jesus. When we see clearly that Jesus said that we would suffer in this world. In fact, John 15, 20 says this. Look at it on the screen. It says, remember the word I spoke to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my word, they will also keep yours. Jesus was making it abundantly clear that you were not going to mistake truth when it came to him. Folks, Jesus is truth. And when truth is lived out, it is a vast contrast to all the other false teachings of this world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Light and darkness do not mix. They contrast one another. And Jesus Christ was making it abundantly clear. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. There's no disassociation from me and you. If you are my follower, what has happened to me will happen to you. If they reject me, they'll reject you. If they receive me, they'll receive you. There is no mistake about it. 
So church, this is what I, I wrestle with in my own heart. I understand and I pray, and I don't think any of us in this room raise our hand and say, give me a bowl full of suffering today. But is it a blessing that we are not persecuted? Think about that. Is it truly a, a blessing to the American church today? that we are not persecuted. Jesus said, if they persecute me, they will persecute you. We pray prayers of thanksgiving, and we should. We should be grateful. We should thank God for how he has moved in this country, how he has given us freedoms and privileges in this country, that are so unusual to so many countries in this world. We have the right to worship. We have the right to declare that we love Jesus. And we truly don't have the fear of suffering from it. But I also have to hesitate in my spirit and say, is this actually a blessing? When Jesus said, my followers will receive what I have received. Persecution, suffering, is an expectation that if we are truly followers of Christ, we can expect it to happen. Paul goes on to say this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Church, read that again. In fact, all... In fact, not here's a theory, here's a possible hypothesis. No, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not a possibility, it's a certainty, it's a truth. It's going to be experienced. So church, I ask ourselves this question again. Is it a blessing that the American church is not dealing with the persecutions and the sufferings that are going on around the world? And you say, well, Chris, yes, because we're, their lives are not being destroyed. My friend, what name are we actually lifting up? In North Korea where some of the heaviest persecution is going on, the church is multiplying. In China, the church is multiplying. Wherever there is suffering, the gospel is advancing. Our names may be getting blotted out, but Jesus' name continues to increase. What name have we been called to live for? Maybe this is why we're not suffering from persecution and, and, and hardships. Because maybe some of the words in this verse have been left out in our life motto. Maybe what we need to replace today, if we're being honest in our heart, is, in fact, maybe that needs to be left out. Or maybe what needs to be left out is that I, the godly life. Oh, I have no, no hesitation that many of us in this room today would say, we're Christians. But I wonder honestly, could we say, are we Christ followers? A Christ follower that would say, in every area of my life, I pursue to make you be known. I can't even give examples and illustrations because they would fall so short of what reality is in other countries with our brothers and sisters. Hundred and eighty Christians dying. A little girl and her brother and their other siblings and their parents go to church today in a beat up church building probably no bigger than one section 
of these seats. No cushion. They're meeting in a field where when you step out of the door, you're stepping into part of the field that have planted crops because they're trying to take advantage of every square inch of space they have. And they're praying and they're lifting up praises to God. And what they don't realize is that three individuals from an Islamic extremist group comes with machine guns. One stands out in the perimeter in case anyone tries to get out. The other two go to the two entryways of the door and they open fire. Little girl sees her 10 year old brother shot to death and her dad suffering. And as people are running out, they get sprayed again by the guy standing in a great opportunity to get anyone that has been missed. And what you hear the church saying is, Jesus, Jesus, be with us. Help us. That's reality, church. That is reality. I don't think we could find any attempt in our world of standing up for Christ in our everyday life that could even equate to what's happening around the world. We truly are in the kiddie pool when it comes to swimming and walking with Jesus in this world. Chris, are you trying to beat us up? No, I'm just trying to soberly, in a humble spirit, have us pause and say, Jesus, if you say we're following you, we will be persecuted. Then why are there so many prayers of thankfulness that we have not been persecuted? And that that is actually a blessing. Could it be that that's actually a curse? That we're not crying out prayers of God help us in the midst of suffering. I think the church needs to soberly examine themselves and ask themselves that question. Why is it happening there but not here? And in some instances it is. But I have to get to my own life personally and say, Lord, where, what, is there any limitations in my life that if this is a natural reaction, if this is an expectation, then why is it still such an exception when circumstances just don't go my way? We have to ask ourselves that question. But I want you to see what happens. Peter's taken into prison. Look at the reaction of the church. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but, much, but prayer was being made earnestly to God for him by the church. Think about this. Their leader that pointed to the leader, Jesus, has just been taken into prison. We know what just happened to his counterpart. He was killed. Peter is probably going to die in their mindset. The more we hang out together, the more we look obvious for the people that are trying to find us. But what do they do? Instead of scattering or instead of banding together to go get Peter or be with him, what do they do? They go and they pray. It wasn't the least they could do. It was the most they could do. The church came together and earnestly prayed. For who? For Peter. Not for their own self. Not for the, thank God, I'm not having to go through that. But no, praying for Peter. So how are we, when we hear a testimony from one of our sisters in Christ, and when we hear the testimony of the persecuted church, what are we to do with that? We're to do the same thing the scripture says to do that they did for Peter. We are to come together and we are to earnestly pray. So what does earnest prayer look like? Number one, I think earnest prayer begins with this. When I look at someone else's needs as if they were on my own, and I carry them in that such of a way. 
that I truly laid myself aside and my self ambitions and what I desire and like the church here not praying for themselves praying for Peter earnest prayer for the persecuted church is when we see their needs as if they were our own second thing about earnest prayer remember they didn't stay in their own houses they felt called to come together in prayer earnest prayer is a collective calling it's not an individual calling it's made up of individuals feeling called to it but it is something we have been called to do your sister in Christ has just shared with you today that there is a stirring for God to get his people together to begin praying for the persecuted and that's not a bridge thing as I believe she shared in the first service she believes in her heart that it's something that God has called our community and our world and our country to and so my prayer is this are we going to collectively come together to pray that's earnest prayer but the third thing is this a desperation for his provision a desperation for God's provision they had no power to go get Peter out of jail they had no political influence to go get Peter out of the jail they couldn't come up with a strategy of how to remove him of this situation why did they come together because all they had was God and I believe earnest prayer is rooted in that for a deep understanding of knowing I can't do nothing about this God, you're in control of it. I bring it to you. Persecution should be an expectation, not an exception. And God has called us to earnestly pray as if the need was our own to come together and to desperately cry out for God. Let's see what happens when the church did this verse 6 through 19 let me read it on the night before Herod was to bring him out for execution Peter bound with two chains was sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell striking Peter on the side he woke him up and said get quick get up and then the chains fell off his wrist get dressed the angel told him and he put on your and put on your sandals and he did so wrap your cloak around you and he told him and follow me so he went out and followed and he did not know that what took place through an angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision verse 10 after they passed the first and second guard post they came to the iron gate that leads into the city which opened to them by itself they went outside and passed one street and immediately the angel left him and then Peter came to himself and said now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all the Jewish people expected when he realized this he went to the house of Mary the mother of John Mark where many had assembled and were praying he knocked at the door in the gateway and a servant named Rhoda came to answer she recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that, that Peter was standing at the gateway. Don't you love those personalities? They get so excited, they can't even do the simple task at the moment. She hears Peter's voice, he goes crazy, leaves him at the door. Verse 15, when she says this, they say, you're crazy, they told her. But she kept insisting that it was true. And then they said, it's his angel. And Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astounded. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he explained to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Report these things to James and the brothers, he said. Then he departed and went to a different place. And at daylight, there was great commotion among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. And after Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated, he interrogated the guards and ordered their ex execution. And then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. When 
when we are persecuted, God's presence is there. When others are persecuted, God has called us to earnestly pray. And God provides, as we see in this testimony. Church, I want to encourage you to meditate on this passage today. I want to encourage you to go home today and think about, what if I was in Peter's shoes? What happens when the church comes together to earnestly pray for those who are suffering? God provides. Now, God may blow, us, blow our minds like he did Peter. He may provide in ways we never understand this side of heaven. But God will provide. Peter, from walking down that road of suffering, experienced God like he had never experienced him before. The church, because they accepted God's invitation to join in praying for their brother Peter, experienced God like they never had before. The lost, Herod and the soldiers, they couldn't tell it was God, but they knew it was something like never before. The world was shaken through this mist of persecution and the response of God's followers and how they reacted to it. And they simply, just desperately got before God and asked for help. Church, this is where I want to close today. I wonder if the reason the world's not seeing our shepherd as they should is because we've forgotten to be sheep. If we would continue to be sheep, would our world see our shepherd in even a greater light? God's not asking for our strategies in the midst of persecution. God's not asking for our strength or our schemes. God is asking us to be his sheep and let him be the protector and the provider. I think that's our biggest issue in the American church today is that we have forgotten to continue to be sheep and desperately wait on God's provision and seek it and yearn for it. We've become too smart. We've become too strong on our own to think that we can handle things when God is saying, no, what you need is me. May we become sheep again. And may we care about others in the flock that are being attacked. And may we cry out for the shepherd to provide. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for the reminder that you are always with us. Lord Jesus, there is a lost world that has no clue of who you are. But I believe, Lord Jesus, if we will follow you, even if the road is a road of suffering, God, that will alert lost people of something mysterious going on what is it that these people believe in that they're willing to suffer for and even die for it God only then will they start seeing your worth by how much we're willing to cling on to you and let go of everything else even if that means our life God I pray Lord Jesus that we will become sheep again sheep that just follow and are totally dependent upon your provision may we be a church God that cares about our brothers and sisters around the world may we be a church people God uh, followers of you that regardless of the situation or the occasion Lord how how foolish it is how terrible it is that we deny you by just because we might get laughed at oh God I just pray you grip our heart to remind us that you are our shepherd and we're not strong without you. You are our everything. And we will keep you over above everything else. God, help us to realize that that is what it means to be a follower of Christ. That you are over everything. You supersede 
everything. You are life itself. And if we have you, we have everything. If we don't have you, we have nothing. God, help us to be that. You are our shepherd. Help us to be your sheep. Amen. Church, the altar is open. I'm down front. If, if you need me to pray with you, you can interrupt me. But just respond to the Lord as we pray for our brothers and sisters in suffering. As we pray for our heart to be willing to identify with them and follow you, Lord Jesus.